Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Dean Speaker Series on Innovators, Changemakers, and Art Vendors, where, where we are featuring some of our most illustrious faculty, alums, and friends of Berkeley Public Health, whose work has transformed the fields of medicine and public health. My name is Michael Liu. I'm the Dean of Berkeley Public Health. And for this first conversation, I'm pleased to bring together a panel who truly exemplify the title of the series, Innovators, Change Makers, and Art Vendors of Public Health. All right, I, I know some of you are probably asking right now, what is an art vendor? I know you get innovators and change makers, and some of you may actually know about air vendors and water vendors, but what's an art vendor? Well, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. assured us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The problem is that the arc doesn't bend by itself. Somebody's got to bend. All six of our panelists tonight exemplify what I call arc benders. They spent their life bending the arc of the moral universe toward justice. And all six of them have a play, a pivotal role in giving life to an idea that is deeply rooted in social justice. An idea so powerful that it has transformed how we conduct research in medicine and public health. That idea is called community-based participatory research or CBPR. It's the idea that when we do research in the community, we do it with the community and not on the community. And while that may sound pretty straightforward, researchers have not always walked the talk. There has been a long dark history of exploitation of community in medical and public health, research, often in the name of studying health disparities. Now, I'm not just talking about heinous crimes such as the Tuskegee syphilis study. I'm talking about when researchers just parachute into a community, extract whatever they need from the community to get their publication and their tenure without ever leaving the community better off. CBPR is the idea that changed all of that. It transformed how medical and public health research is designed, conducted, and funded. Today, I'm proud to bring together six giants in the field to have a conversation about how the idea came about, what have we learned in the past decades, and where do we go from here to take CBPR to the next level. With us today in alphabetical orders are Bonnie Duran, professor in the School of Social Work and Public Health at the University of Washington, and a proud of alum of our schools, MPH and DRPH, class of 19, uh, 1997. Professor Duran has worked in public health research, evaluation, and education with tribes, native organizations, and other communities of color for over 35 years. Her past work includes partnering with the Navajo Nation, the Indian Health Service, the National Congress of American Indian Policy Research Center, and other indigenous community-based organizations on um, projects aimed at health equity, improving health services, and developing culture-centered health promotion. Larry Green, Professor Emeritus of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF, is also a proud alum of our school's MPH and DRPH program, class of 68. Professor Green was the director of the Office of Science and Extramural Research for CDC before joining UCSF in 2005. He previously held full-time public health and medical faculty positions at Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Texas, and the University of British Columbia. He was the first director of the Federal Office of Health Promotion under the Carter administration and a vice president of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation and elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Alec Green Martin has extensive background in public health advocacy, public health policy, programming, and CBPR, spanning over the past 40 years in Flint, Michigan, and the surrounding areas. Her public health efforts focus on facilitating community academic practice partnership building, developing, managing, and evaluating community-based projects 
and training programs for students and community members and developing and elevating the community voice and advocating for community inclusiveness at both state and national levels. Ms. Green Modin currently serves as the administrator of the community-based organization partners and a community ethics review board in Flint, Michigan. Mary Minkla is a professor emerita of health and social behavior, behavior at Berkeley Public Health. Also a proud alum of our MPH and DRPH program, class of 75, and later became chair of the program and founding director of UC Berkeley Center on Aging. She has more than 35 years of experience in developing and implementing community partnership, community organizing, and CBPR to study and address health equity and social justice and continue to work with diverse community groups, including low-income youth and elders, women of color, and formerly incarcerated people. She has co-edited and authored nine books, including the field-defining book on CBPR, which she co-edited with Nita Wallerstein, and just this last year published a new book called Community Organizing and Community Building for Health and Welfare, which is a must read for anyone interested in community organizing. <laughs> Emily Ozer is a clinical community psychologist and professor of health and social behavior at Berkeley Public Health, whose multi-method research focuses on the development, uh, on the role of school climate in adolescent development and mental health, psychological resilience, school-based interventions, and youth participatory action research, which is an equity-focused approach in which youth generate systematic research evidence to address problems they want to improve in their schools and communities. She's a leading, she's leading a sixth district study in California, Colorado, New Jersey, and Ohio, funded by a WT grant to study and strengthen youth participatory action research in K through 12 school systems. She's also co-leading a campus-wide effort to better acknowledge and support community engagement in the faculty merit and promotion process. Anina Wallerstein, Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Director of the Center for Participatory Research at the University of New Mexico, and also a proud alum of our DRPH program. She has more than 40 years of experience working with CBPR and empowerment interventions. And as I mentioned earlier, she co-edited the, the field-defining textbook on CBPR with Mary Minkler. She oversees the annual University of Mexico CBPR Summer Institute in Indigenous and Critical Methodologies, which draws participants globally. So welcome to all of you. Let's start with a question for all of our panelists. For our audience who may be less familiar with CBPR, can you explain what is CBPR? What do you consider are the most important principles or tenets of CBPR? And how is CBPR different from how research has traditionally been conducted in medicine and public health? And let's go in this order, Mary, Nina, Larry, Bonnie, Ella, and Emily, and we'll start with you, Mary. Thank you, Michael, and thanks so much for putting together this amazing panel of friends and colleagues I have been learning from for the last 30 some years. Um, and also I wanna thank you for your visionary leadership of the school, your commitment to good trouble and to transformative change, especially during these fraught times. My high school debate coach said never begin with an apology, but I do want to apologize for my voice, which is pretty raggedy. It'll be better next week, but I'm sorry it wasn't in time for the panel. I'm also sorry I didn't get a chance to clean this study. Anyway, um, to your question, Michael. CBPR is often erroneously described as a research method, and it's rather an orientation to research that can involve any number of qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method approaches. As two of our colleagues in the UK pointed out years ago, what's distinctive about CBPR is not the methods, but the methodological context of their application. What's new is the attitude of researchers which in turn determines for whom and by whom the research is conceptualized and conducted and the corresponding location of power at every stage 
in the research process. Now, Larry and his colleagues in Canada developed a early, wonderful, still widely used definition of participatory research, and I'm sure he'll share that. Um, but building on his work and that of Barbara Israel and her colleagues in, uh, in Michigan, both university and, and community, uh, and also, uh, well, let me just backtrack and say building on those two giants in the field and their work, uh, the Kellogg Community Health Scholars Program, which uh, Ellen Elle and I were both involved with for many years, came up with a slightly tweaked definition of CBPR that I continue to like. They define it as a collaborative process that equitably involves all partners in the research and recognizes the unique strengths they bring. It begins with a topic of importance to the community with the aim of combining knowledge and action for social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. Today, we would probably talk about health inequities rather than disparities, all important bending of the art. And I would only add to that that today also, in keeping with the uh, much more serious efforts to finally address racism in all its forms, we need to articulate that CBPR should always be conducted with uh, cultural humility and using the lenses of anti-racism and equity throughout the world. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dean Liu, and I totally appreciate this opportunity and say that many of us were actually students of Mary and Mary's kids, we call ourselves. <laughs> Thanks, Mary, for that kind of really broad overview. One is that it's always, always research with. And as a core, core tenant, and I'll even move it further to say it's often and should be even more research being led by communities with their priorities, needs, and, and strengths also leading the effort. So research with and research by. The second thing I wanna say is we often talk about academic evidence and the academic knowledge that's important for research, but I would add for CBPR, we have to add the equal status of community evidence and community knowledge, which of course brings us to what is being considered very important these days, a recognition of knowledge democracy and leading our way to creating a better world together when we join forces with these two knowledges rather than just one set of knowledge. So I will leave it at that for my other colleagues. Oh, I can see you now. here in the School of Public Health during the final years of Dorothy Neiswander's uh, tenure as, as faculty and still available. more effectively or extensively than Dr. Minkler and um, now later Professor Minkler. She's been the author of several influential books as have Nina and, uh, and others. Some of them co-authored with her former students on this panel, Nina and Bonnie Duran, whom I now count among my academic grandchildren. <laughs> So I'll leave it at that because I think they've, they've defined it better than I could. Great, thank you, Larry. Well, let, let's go Bonnie next. Uh, Bonnie, what, what really stands out for you 
uh, in terms of the central tenets and principles of CBPR? Um, well, first of all, let me also say what a wonderful a gathering this is, and I'm very honored to be del uh, to be invited. And Mary Minkler was my professor <laughs> and had a huge impact on my um, academic training. Uh, and Larry Green was one of my practicum um, mentors, had a huge impact. And Nina has been a wonderful guiding force forever. For me, you know, there's a concept out uh, in higher ed right now called epistemic injustice. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, where some people's ideas and views of the world are predominant and they really lead what questions are and how investigations are done. But this whole idea of epistemic injustice takes into consideration uh, knowledge systems from the global south. And I work in predominantly American Indian, uh, Native American, urban and reservation based communities and actually indigenous communities all over the world. And we're definitely an epistemology of the global south and CBPR allows the space. There's this other fancy term called hermeneutical resources space for people to understand what's happening to them from their direct experience instead of you know looking on you know a social epidemiology paper or the dsm-5 or something like that it allows space for people to come up with their own theories of etiology and what interventions would be useful for them and to have it be much more meaningful and uh, self-directed. So those are the reasons I think CBPR are really important. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, let's go to Ella next. Uh, Ella, anything you want to add in terms of definition principles? Uh, and how is different from how you've seen research traditionally co conducted in the community? So uh, thanks um, again for the invitation. I'm uh, really excited to be part of this panel and um, serving with a number of folk who I've worked with over the years as um, a community partner. Um, nothing to add on the definition, but I would like to add a couple of points on the important tenets. One being um, that there um, should be an acknowledging of uh, community as a unit of identity um, and acknowledging that the community as a whole has importance and should have its thoughts, opinions, and values heard and honored. And lastly, I'll say, um, while all of these are important uh, to communities, uh, dissemination of results to all partners is, is really important and dissemination in a way that community members are able to use the information to build their capacity. Um, and as far as the um, what's different, I can honestly say that I've never worked in an era where we were not using CBPR. I was introduced to public health uh, through CBPR. So I, this is all I've known, but I've, I've heard of instances where, um, you know, other types of work has been done where the community was not recognized. Uh, you mentioned the parachute research where um, uh, researchers would just come in and do what they do and take the information and go away. Uh, communities would not hear about it. So it did not involve the community at all. And um, quite frankly, it wasn't done to benefit the community. So I'm honestly, I'm glad that I came in on the, the part where community was invited into the conversation and respected as part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Ella. Uh, let's go, Emily, next. Yeah, thank you. Well, I have just to add to this beautiful, wise um, descriptions, um, I think most of my work has been with organizations um, and young people doing uh, participatory research in K-12 settings. And so I, I think the piece I would add here with a lens on youth and youth development um, is particularly around the ways that um, young people are typically not seen as expert, um, particularly about the systems um, that affect them, whether those be school systems or other kinds of systems. And so I think um, a piece that's important is, is sort of where ageism off also comes in, in terms of um, young people being um, experts on their own experience. And also I would say um, 
there are many forms of youth participation that have gotten a lot of um, attention and um, in, in, uh, and, and we're more familiar with youth organizing or youth activism or other forms of youth participation that might be more like educational showcases. And so I think a key piece related to the social justice and equity focus of, of participatory research in CBPR is accountability and systems. And so in addition to the knowledge generation and the change, sort of how is that evidence that is generated by young people being uh, taken up in those systems? And what are the um, ways that we can um, uh, make sure that it goes beyond the knowledge generation into actual change? Thanks. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, let me ask a follow-up question for all of our panelists. And you know, I was doing some quick math uh, while doing the introduction. Collectively, there's like more than 200 years uh, of experience kind of doing uh, uh, CBPR among our panelists. Uh, so I guess, okay, let, me, let, let me pose this question. Uh, can you just give an example drawing from your work uh, your experience that can help us kind of illustrate uh, both the power as well as the challenges of doing CBPR. Uh, and, and let's maybe go in reverse order this time. We'll, we'll start with you, Emily. Okay, great. I don't know if I need to turn on this light because since we started, it's gotten a little darker. So I'll, I'll do that when I'm not speaking. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I've been in partnership with an amazing organization in San Francisco called San Francisco Peer Resources for almost 20 years. And so there have been hundreds of uh, YPAR projects that um, that organization that young people have done in elective classes in, second, in middle and high schools. And so there have been so many different examples of um, impact and challenge, but maybe just to pick one or two, thinking about um, the best practices club that Gary Cruz and his students at O'Connell, John O'Connell High School and now at, um, at uh, Everett Middle School in the Mission District in San Francisco, where students um, were gathering data on culturally responsive teaching practices and uh, leading um, professional development for their teachers. So really directly bringing their evidence into action by, by intervening um, with teachers in a collaborative way. And then years of work at Lowell High School in San Francisco, focusing on uh, students uh, trying to increase diversity um, at that high school, um, working on issues of um, climate and microaggressions, working on trans, uh, transportation with the Muni system, the bus system, so really um, students uh, working on all the different um, aspects of, of equity and um, using very um, systematic research designs to, to advocate for change. Thanks. Thanks so much. What, what challenges have you run into doing this work in the schools? Oh my goodness. Um, well, you're asking me this question in the midst of a huge budget crisis in San Francisco that is affecting the, um, the funding for San Francisco peer resources. But I think um, the you know, turnover and churn in school districts, capacity issues, um, those are challenges. Um, and, and, and unlike a CBO model or community-based organization model, you also have students transitioning in and out of classes. So there are interesting challenges around um, to what extent do young people continue to work on the issues that prior students identified to have policy traction versus, versus that um, being able to really focus on the question that they're coming in with. Um, so many strategic and political challenges, and I think just working in a K-12 system where young people um, obviously you know, have less power and the, the, the folks that they're advocating to have um, grading power over them and other kinds of power over them. So those are some of the challenges, but I think um, working with amazing partners um, has, has uh, made, made a huge difference. So many, many challenges if we have more time um, and uh, strategies I could share. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Ellen next. And Ellen, you, you, you've been doing this work uh, in Flint, Michigan and surrounding areas uh, for a very long time. Can, can you talk about your work and uh, provide an example 
uh, that really illustrate both the, the power and the challenges of CDPR. Right. So when I thought about the question, um, and and I could very easily say that there are a number of um, examples that you know I could talk about that would deal with the the power dynamics of you know where the community doesn't have power or the challenges that there are for communities to participate in a research period. Um, but I, I wanted to focus on one specific um, program that, and, and we were actually just uh, reminiscing about this a couple of days ago with um, community partners. Uh, this was one of our, I'm gonna say one of our premier uh, projects in the community, the Fathers and Sons Project um, which actually was a very successful project, uh, pre but presented both power and challenges uh, for both the uh, academic partners and community partners, but probably in reverse order. Um, because one area of power exercised by community partners was remaining in a discussion and holding pattern during this project for several months, getting nothing done, because we needed some changes made to the process. And it was, it was uh, noticeable by everyone, including our funders. They were a little concerned, um, but we, as, as community partners, we uh, stood our ground uh, because these were, were changes that needed to be done to the process because it didn't reflect the way it should be done in our community. So we stood our ground on that. Um, and uh, we were informed that we were actually in that pattern for several months. I think uh, one of our PIs said it was around 11 months that we just we were going back and forth. Uh, but being able to move forward, having those requests um, put in place and having an even stronger program that received additional funding for additional funding cycles. Um, it was a feather in the whole team's cap. But a huge challenge for the community partners was the fact that we were holding up progress for this work. Uh, we didn't know what it was gonna mean for future um, collaborations with our partners. And we were also concerned that one of the primaries from the academic institution was up for tenure. We knew that. And we didn't wanna do anything that was going to cause her who just happened to be an African-American young woman, we didn't wanna do anything that would cause her not to be able to um, attain tenure. And so while we st stood our ground, we let it play out. Um, the the um, academic partner did receive tenure, but it was a very stressful time for us. And um, because we were a very strong unit within the community, we were able to do that. But that was you know, slightly different. Usually community partners don't have that kind of power, don't assert that kind of power in uh, any situation. But that was something that happened to us. And I think, I know we still learn from it because this happened years ago and we were just talking about it this past week. So, um, yeah. That, that, thank you so much, Alan. I, I think that's a great example. Uh, let's go to Bonnie next. Uh, example from your work that demonstrates the, the, the power and challenges of CDPR? Um, yes, I can think. Uh, one of my biggest uh, partners have been all of the tribal colleges. You know, there's 37 tribal colleges in the United States, actually and one in Canada. And uh, we have been working with them doing social epidemiology and interventions for substance abuse related issues and any issues that we're finding that are preventing people from graduating from tribal colleges. And um, yeah, it's great. You know, sometimes being an old brown woman, people think I need to go get them another cup of coffee or something. But <laughs> when I'm with my tribal college partners, it's actually an, an, quite an advantage because they speak what, you know, their truth is to me. I remember uh, some years ago, uh, the president of one of the tribal colleges, actually that's closest to Seattle, said, Bonnie, 
you know, we'll work with you, but you have to do strength-based, resiliency-based approaches. We're tired of, you know, you giving us all of these uh, negative stereotype DSM categories or talking about how we're, you know, messed up and substance abuse and things like that. You know, if you're not going to do resiliency-based, cultural revitalization, culture centers approaches, we don't want to work with you. And that was excellent because that was exactly right now, that's the trending thing, right? To do resilience-based positive psych approaches. And, you know, uh, I think our communities are often on the cutting edge of that. So I think that's a good example of, um, you know, having the truth be told to you because, you know, you're not a dominant, um, you know, a dominant figure within the research uh, arena. Thanks so much, Bonnie. Uh, let's go to Larry next. Uh, Larry, example from your work. Yeah, I, it, when I went to the federal government, uh, I was escaping in a way the rigors of academic life insofar as they seemed to demand that anything I wanted to do with any distinction at the university had to start with evidence-based practices and go to the field to test them. What I was discovering through community-based participatory research was that a lot of the evidence was coming from the field. And I ended up coining a phrase that uh, I used in the federal government to set up a different approach to grant making for research. And that was, if we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. And that resonated with <clears throat> the people of our persuasion, but of course it, uh, it rankled a lot of the academics, mm -hmm. but it did, it did gain ground and, and began to catch on. And people always were asking me to explain myself, which I love trying to do. But I think that's, that's a very fundamental distinction between what CBPR has brought as a recognition about evidence and what evidence should be guiding our practice. It's the practice, the practice based evidence, as opposed to research-based evidence that is often done in a, in a context that is not really practice-based. So uh, I'll stop there. Well, uh, Larry, let, let me ask you a follow-up question because you know, I, I just kind of love kind of what you said about if you want more evidence-based practice, uh, you need more practice-based evidence. Uh, and you were really uh, an early pioneer and champion uh, of that in terms of transforming how uh, uh, kind of research is funded uh, in, in, in academic institutions and schools of public health. H have you seen any progress toward practice to generating more practice-based evidence uh, over the last 20 years? Well, I stopped doing literature reviews when I retired. <laughs> so I can't claim to have a, a real handle on how things have changed, but I certainly see a lot of a lot more articles in the literature that cross my desk or my mailbox uh, where that phrase has been picked up and used strategically for justifying a, an approach to research that seems now to have been accepted by some of the foundations at least, and in some, uh, some parts of the government, CDC more, more than others. But um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I think is a good example of where we've had a, a very receptive year for that, that concept. Uh, I won't claim more for it, but um, I, I, I haven't been uh, extricated from the field. So I'm, I'm going to stick with it. And, and what challenges do you see in terms of 
really promoting more practice-based evidence. Which what? Uh, what, what challenge have, have you seen in terms of really advancing more uh, practice-based evidence in academic research? Well, I think the challenge has been overcoming the long tradition of research needing to start with a hypothesis based on previous research, as opposed, and, and this is particularly the, the NIH tradition of research, but the other agencies have, have aped the, CD, the uh, NIH model to a large extent. And so the demand in getting grants is often to pursue a, an evidence-based practice hypothesis and not to start with discussions with the field in a CBPR mode to discover what are the practices that warrant research. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Well, let's uh, go to Nina next. Nina, can, can you just could talk from your work, your experience, uh, provide us an example of uh, your work that, that really demonstrate the, the power and challenges of CBPR? So I think of myself as an intervention researcher and interventionist. I want to act you know, for, with programs, with development of initiatives that make a difference, that change lives, that improve health. So I started um, working in also in tribal communities, um, you know, since the late eighties, but with Bonnie in the late nineties started a, a process with a number of tribes that have kept going. And I've seen what I've really seen the power of this when the issues come from the tribes of what they want to do is they own the work. Mm -hmm. They use the work, they apply the work, they continue the work. Even mm -hmm. if we're not funded, they continue the work. And Bonnie and I started actually doing this CDC funded project in a couple tribes around social capital. We called it the Community Voices Project and Community Capacity Building. Our tribal partners were perfectly happy to work with us. We got approval. We went through all their sovereign nations. We went through all the tribal IRBs and tribal council approvals, but it wasn't really driven by them. The results of that work though, the, inter the interviews, the focus groups, the learnings from tribal councilmen down to program people had them begin to develop what they wanted. And they wanted a family, back to resiliency, a family resiliency program that was based on culture and language as protective factors for preventing kids from taking on substance abuse and other risk factors. And so we built the program together and, it, they, and we built it with three different tribes over time. And we built it with some shared cognitive behavioral preventive messages that we knew came from the literature, but a lot of the program was built on their own cultural history, cultural language, values, knowledge, and they have come up with their own curriculum that they're now using in different places. It's an after-school dinner-based program for elders, uh, parents, and fourth, fifth, sixth graders. So it's an intergenerational culture-centered program that it doesn't matter the years that we don't have funding, they keep implementing, they keep working and integrating it into their tribal other efforts, into the summer program, into school curriculum, into other grant applications that they're writing. So it's, a, it's been very exciting to have NIH funding to test the effectiveness of the program. We now have another level R01 to um, large NIH grant to, um, uh, disseminate to other tribal nations. And so we're working in a, and they are, our tribal partners are the ones helping coach the new tribal communities to recenter the curriculum in their tribal values and knowledge and, and histories. Histories are really important, especially now under the threats from COVID and the suffering that communities are, are going through. People are wanting to reclaim their histories. They're wanting to re, 
um, to really say we have identity and strength here because we are facing so much. So it's been a really an important um, uh, solid ground. The challenge, of course, is that I, PI, Bonnie, when she was working, when we were working on this together before, we've done, done other work together, but then when she moved to Washington, we couldn't continue that part together. Um, the challenge, of course, is that you have to let go. You have to let go of controlling the research. And it's particularly, I can hear it, see it when they start talking in their own language. And of course, they, when I'm still there, they don't want me to hear what they're, or they will translate to me what they want to translate back to me. <laughs> and it's very interesting to watch that progression of, and we're comfortable with each other because there's a lot of mutual respect. I know that they're working out whatever they need to work out. And I don't quite know sometimes what the decision will be, but those decisions of where we're moving forward um, are, are, are shared in many ways. And then of course, I recognize that there are certain things as a white outsider to that community, I won't ever know and I should not know. So that's a really important learning to me about being an active partnering kind of researcher that I can do some things together with my community partners. I can bring my own integrity and um, knowledge but I also have to recognize that they're making their decisions based on what the community needs. And we can then develop you know, the next stage of research together. Thanks so much, Nina. Uh, let's um, go to Mary. Uh, Mary, examples from your work that demonstrate the, the power and challenges of CDPR. You're asking me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually going to give a, a very specific example, and it's one of the first CBPR projects I was ever involved in. It was in the late 1980s, the twin epidemics of crack cocaine and mass incarceration of drug users who were Black but not white, and what that did for the whole Black community and the kids and the grandparents who got caught up in this nightmare it was just a horrific time that didn't need to be that way. Well, I want to focus mostly on the beginning of the project um, because that's where the biggest challenges were. Then I'll tell you a tiny bit about it and quickly say a little about the dissemination of the action plan, which was also um, very revealing and important to me. Um, I, the, my colleague, Dr. Kathleen Rowe, and I both knew, had, we had close friends who were older African-American grandparents who had stepped in to raise their grandchildren and saw their lives turned upside down, saw their health uh, go downhill uh, as a result. And we started talking to colleagues at Highland Hospital, San Francisco General. I talked to a friend at, at the Harlem Hospital, all seeing the same thing, big increase in older women coming in, formerly had diabetes and, and uh, hypertension under control, and they're coming in with out of control conditions and back pain and insomnia and everything else. And the common denominator was always that they were raising grandchildren. Well, Kathy and I really wanted to study this problem, but we as two white women really questioned whether we had any business doing this at all. So we asked a number of our black friends and colleagues, and we also uh, spoke at length with a wonderful colleague in the School of Public Health, Frankie Saunders, who had very deep roots in the Black community. And she responded very affirmatively, as the others did. And she also said, I'll be your cultural guide. So she joined us. And she and I, for example, met with staff at two large Black community organizations in Oakland. And I asked them straight out, is this a problem in your community? And if so, is it one that we and our African-American graduate students might be able to help study? And if that's true, would you consider partnering with us? And what could we do to make it worth your while? So we hadn't written a grant yet. We wanted to make sure the community and their organizations were okay with this. And then if they were, we wanted to write a grant that would um, put substantial funds for the community partners. Well, fast forward, these organizations helped create uh, the most amazing community advisory board I think I've ever worked with. Uh, the members were all older African-American women. 
They were partners in every step of the process. And I'm just going to give you one example. We were going to use a um, standard measure of income, a question about income. And they said, don't use that. You're not going to get answers. And they said, ask <laughs> how much money is available to you for helping raise these children. And when we asked it that way, I mean, I heard one woman yelling behind the door, hey, John, how much of your social security check are you kicking me? Uh, you know, because there was money being made under the table. People were doing what they had to do. We got amazing information. I'm just going to share one line from a grandparent, which kind of gives you uh, a sense of how powerful this study was before I get to how the findings were used. This was a woman who uh, two of us would always go and do two interviews with each of these women over five hours. And um, this woman opened the interview by saying, I have three children, my nine month old who was born drug abuse, drug addicted, my uh, 17 month old who's HIV positive and my 83 year old mother or grandmother with dementia and all three of them uh, are in diapers. Mm. Uh, what a, I, I just, you know, you just want to <laughs> stop the interview and hug her. Um, Anyway, that's the kind of thing we were hearing. I asked a formerly homeless woman, what was the best thing that happened this, this week? And she said, having a doorbell, you know, and you start crying. It's just, it's very difficult, but so important. And they wanted to talk and they didn't stop. And they told us all the other people we should be interviewing. Oh, she has it worse. She has 16 of her grandkids from three different kids living with her. Mm -hmm. I uh, just amazing. Well, let me quick, I could go on forever as you can see, but let me skip to the dissemination and the action phase. One of the things that's traditionally done in CBPR is you start the dissemination by going back to the people who shared their lives and their knowledge and understanding with you. So we began partway through the study when it was um, quite clear that it was going in a very important direction. We started saying to the participants, we want to, you know, give back to you guys and we want you to be the sure, first ones to learn what we found and tell us if we got it wrong. And we're thinking about a nice luncheon. Would you like to help plan it? And they jumped at it. They really wanted to make this their event. So that a number of the participants themselves, along with advisory board members, planned this amazing elaborate luncheon in a fancy hotel. And it was interesting, they said, we want the media. This story needs to get out. Our stories need to get out. And I said, great, what about politicians? So you can, no, we don't want politicians. They have disappointed us, so no politicians. Well, they did get a lot of media attention. And um, you know, one of the things that Kathy and I did was always keep a list of the grandparents who wanted to tell their stories to the media. So when they would call us, as they did very often for, um, you know, appearances on news programs or just to give them information for the, the next story they were writing, we would say, talk to the women themselves and here are some that want to talk to you. And that was really helpful. And some of the women became incredible advocates and, you know, feeling empowered about going to the media themselves and, and helping make things, get things done. Well, um, just quickly, uh, yeah. okay, we also, just uh, to be clear, we, we did value the importance of academic publishing. We did publish in about 10 referee journals. We also wrote a book, and uh, that was partly because the women said their biggest need was for a respite center. We thought, well, we can do a book and all the proceeds can go to the respite center. So we kept it kept alive for many years anyway. But the most important thing, I think, apart from the publications getting the word out, was with the advisory board members and some of the participants, we helped found a regional and a statewide coalition on grandparent caregiving that was going to work on changing the fact that, for example, um, women who get welfare, I mean, sorry, women who are in the uh, adopt foster kids uh, get way more money than women who take in their grandchildren. And at one of the meetings, one of them was saying, hey, I'll take in yours, you take in mine, and we'll both see our income go up. Um, but anyway, they wanted to work on those kinds of inequities. 
they had great concern about how hard it was for them and other grandparents to get any kind of information. One thing about, about you know, about what's the impact of crack, crack in your system as a kid, what happens? Uh, they wanted to know about where can we get resources? So we um, got money to create a national information resource center in the School of Public Health. It was in the uh, Center on Aging and eventually got so big, we had to move it from the school to AARP. But that was something that the women really wanted to see. And finally, they said, get the numbers. We really want the numbers so this problem will stand out. So I worked with a doctoral student and uh, we built on the findings of the grandparent study to do uh, several large national studies of grandparent caregivers, uh, or just looking at grandparent caregivers and the impact of that on uh, health and social outcomes. Both the original uh, CBPR data and the quantitative data led to an invitation by the Census Bureau to get the embargo data from the American Community Survey to work on this and to get the first uh, two questions into the census on grandparent caregiving. So we finally have a national database that everybody respects that covers this information. So uh, much too long an example. It's hard for me to talk about that one because it's still so close to my heart. Oh, and just to just, well, no, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. Um, I was, <laughs> I took, okay. I took in two young men when they aged out of foster care. They became members of our family, both of them were the children of this situation. Mm -hmm. And they were just sweethearts, but you know, first hearing through the grandparents and then hearing through our sons is just very powerful. Anyway, thank you for indulging me. Oh gosh, <laughs> no, that, that, thank you, Mary. Uh, and thank you all for, for sharing those examples. I, I wanna just kind of dive deeper uh, into some of what you just said and, and some of your work. Uh, and let's, let's start with Nina. Uh, so, Nina, in much of your writing, you call attention to the differential in power and privilege uh, between academic and community researchers, and I've certainly seen that in my own experience with CDPR. So, drawing from your experience, can you talk about how such imbalance in power and privilege can undermine CDPR, and what can be done to build more equal partnership in CDPR in light of such imbalance? So I think several people have already been talking about power and privilege. Ella is certainly saying the power of her community board to hold up a study because of needing to make change. And Emily talking about ageism already and Mary talking even about the, you know making sure that the power of the grandparents' voices were heard. But I think, and when I step back and think about the importance of it, I first got wind of this when I was doing this healthy community evaluation around New Mexico and realized that everybody was saying, you know, the center of the state, Albuquerque, you always expect us to drive there. Mm -hmm. You know, it must be that the distance is a shorter distance to drive to from our place in the state to Albuquerque than to drive for asking you to drive out. And I realized that power immediately was be, you know, cause here I was in the academic center and I was expecting people to come to me. And I had to learn very soon that that is not the way to do CBPR. So first of all, the power of academics, the power of this institution, which where we can get resources, where we can get NIH funding, the power of the academic elite. We've been talking many times already about knowledge, you know, from evidence-based uh, practice versus practice-based evidence, that the power of academic knowledge is seen as the right kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. or, and then of course, the academy is filled with white academics like me, you know, and the minorities, uh, faculty of color, are now more in the academy, but they're still very, very, very much a need to promote and build that in. And the minority tax and burden on faculty of color is much higher because there are fewer people. So they're asked to be, a lot of students of color want them as their mentors. 
um, they're asked to serve on all these committees because you always need a diversity person in your committee. So there's a lot of tax on scholars of color so that they don't have the same kind of time. And so there's a lot of white privilege in, you know, that I've become very aware of, whether it's because of my academic background, because I'm white, because of my resources I grew up with, that I think really make it very difficult sometimes to say, no, we are genuine partners and your knowledge is as important to this process as my knowledge and your needs and priorities and strengths of your community is what's gonna drive this. So I think we have to always talk about it and, and um, make sure that we're really willing to challenge ourselves. That's what cultural humility is about. That's what humility is about, is being willing to challenge ourselves. I think for me, I'll just say very directly, I've had this gift of working for the last 30 years with tribal partners, with indigenous communities. I had a great partner with Bonnie as a colleague early on. I am a perfectly lovely human being, but I don't think I could have had as much um, influence or, or ability to work in with tribal partners in my life if I didn't have as team members with me, native scholars and native students and really searching for, and Mary talked about having African-American students with the grandparent study as a white academic herself. And it's really important to build these teams that really do seriously represent uh, or who come from, I hate the word represent, so I should not say that, who come from the communities that we're working with. So I recognize my, what I can offer and I recognize my own limitations. So I think it's, it's really that kind of recognition has enabled me to try and create very, very, um, as much as I can see genuine partner, partnering relationships I also recognize that tribal nations are tribal uh, communities are sovereign nations and they have the power to kick me out. Mm -hmm. um, and I've almost been kicked out, so I can just say, um, but, but I also know that I, you know, um, Mary Northridge very, in a very early uh, editorial of hers in the American Journal of Public Health, I always come back to saying, you know, the core principles you have to take with you and st strategies are listen, 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 um, and show up, mm -hmm. which means you don't expect people to come to your center. You go out to the community and then believe in social justice. So that show, I had to learn that show up when some of my rural partners in that very early thing, uh, healthy community evaluation said to me, why aren't you coming and driving out the four hours that you need to drive to get to my part of the state, you know, and, and, or drive the other next other Southwest part of the state five hours, because it goes over a mountain range. Why aren't you doing that? And I had to realize that if I was going to be dedicated to genuine partnership, I had to do that. And my teams had to do that. So that some ways I've learned to deal with it and believe that it's worth the time because it expresses the value of partnering. Okay, th thanks so much, Nina. Uh, let me ask a follow-up question for Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie, it, it, in some of your writings, you talk about the importance of cultural humility uh, to the work of CDPR. For, for all the researchers out there, what can they do to cultivate cultural humility? What, what, um researchers can do to cultivate uh, cultural humility? Well, <laughs> um, actually tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I'm taking a <laughs> plane to the Insight Meditation Society to teach a mindfulness retreat. <laughs> so uh, mindfulness, which is an epistemology of the global south, excellent at um, catching ourselves. You know, I'm an old brown woman and I see racism, sexism, homophobia, ageism, all of those things here all the time. So I think um, our system, higher ed, is absolutely run on a lot of unconscious bias. And on the idea that, you know, Western knowledge is the pinnacle of social evolution and that, you know, Western lifestyles and Western knowledge and Western economic systems 
uh, need to be strengthened and spread around the globe. And I think uh, there's a big problem with that. You know, it's causing a lot of climate degradation and um, definitely, definitely interfering with, I mean, you know, definitely it has a huge impact on uh, indigenous communities here, you know, from South America up through Canada and Alaska. And it hasn't had a good impact on it either. Yeah. Uh, so um, what other things that people can do? I think, you know, I mean, it's really wonderful to work with communities because there's so much knowledge in communities, particularly if you give people the time to do their own meaning making. You know, one big example of that is uh, the, um, the uh, theory of historical trauma. You know, historical trauma was a theory that came together when a lot of community groups are uh, actually indigenous groups got HRSA and sent some money for conferences back in the 80s. Uh, late 70s and 80s, there was a lot of HRSA and SAMHSA money for getting together. And at those meetings, people came up with the idea of historical trauma. It was really a collective idea that challenged, you know, that indigenous people had poor health because we were genetically or culturally inferior. <laughs> and, you know, some of the theories that are informing uh, interventions now have that, you know, something like that as an underlying um, foundation of what should be done. You know, people need to become more Western to become healthier. And, you know, we can see that that's absolutely not true. So um, how to be more, um, you know, that's a very difficult question. How do people realize that they have a lot of inherent bias? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, 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 Bonnie, let me ask uh, you a follow-up question. Uh, and certainly, uh, researchers can come, come into a community uh, for all the best intentions, and they could even they, they could cause and deepen that historical trauma. So, so I, I know when I was kind of teaching at UCLA, I used to invite Ms. Loretta Jones, uh, a dear friend who was a uh, formerly the CEO of Healthy African American Families, uh, who passed away a few years ago, to come and talk to my students about the do's and don'ts of working with her community. So, so I was going to ask you, can you talk about the do's and don'ts that you want faculty, students, and researchers out there to know about kind of working in your community? Sure, yeah. Um, I think one thing is that um, you know, we're so lucky that in tribal communities, both urban and reservation-based communities, nation-based communities, we have uh, tribal sovereignty and data sovereignty. Uh, and so, um, you know, as Nina said, <laughs> if we don't go through multiple approval processes and make sure that the community doing, we'll get escorted escort, uh, escorted off of the uh, land by tribal police. So um, one thing is that you absolutely have to go through tribal uh, approval process, tribal council. Many tribes have their own institutional review board, and you have to go through that. And uh, it has to, you have to say very specifically, in your data sharing and ownership agreement, why this is going to be beneficial to the tribe or urban Indian organization. Uh, you know, you have to state how this is going to positively impact people. So um, I think that's one thing that people can do. And you know what I always tell people is, uh, I remember once I was teaching a community-based participatory research class, you know, at University of Washington, and I had a few doctoral students from, um, I think they were from um, the architecture program, you know, ar architects. And they actually came to see me with one of their professors and they said, uh, oh, actually, no, it was environmental science. <laughs> and they came to see me and they said, you know, we just got a grant to work with tribal communities. We want to teach tribal communities about um, uh, climate change and about, you know, uh, land loss and things like that. And I said, what, you want to go into tribal communities and teach them about climate change? And they said, yes, we just have some funding to do that. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Every single tribal council 
Um, every single tribe and tribal consortium has a special committee for climate change, and they've had that for the last 20 years. You know, most of the money that, um, you know, tribes are making through uh, gaming and other things that are uh, bringing in money, they spend a huge amount of money on habitat restoration for their relatives, the salmon and the, uh, and the whales and things like that. So... I would say, you know, um, if you really want to do work that's important or that's meaningful in tribal communities that really addresses a big health disparity, assume that there is a group of Native people already working on that and that are already experts in that and go find them and approach them and say, I have some expertise in this. How can I support you? How can I help you? And what are you doing? I think that would be a good way is to assume uh, not only indigenous communities, but all historically marginalized groups, if it is a big, you know, health inequity, if there's a big, um, you know, uh, larger rates of a bad uh, illness or condition within a certain group, there are already people who are working on that. I can pretty much guarantee you that. So go find them first. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, let me go to Ella next. And Ella, yeah, over the years, you've seen just how institutionalized racism uh, has uh, uh, played out in Flint, Michigan, which was finally kind of brought to light through the Flint water crisis. So can you talk about the role institutionalized racism has played in, in causing health disparities in your community and how CPPR can be used uh, to dismantle institutionalized racism in the community? Uh, so I think for for me and many of my uh, community partners, it was wrapping our heads around the whole concept of institutionalized racism. Um, we had been doing work for a number of years, you know, looking at racism, actually um, the undoing racism workshops to dismantle racism. So we had, you know, we'd done some work and we knew and, and just, you know, lived experiences we knew it existed, but to understand how interrelated and interconnected it is to other things that happens in a community, um, understanding that when we talk about institutional racism, we're talking about structures and we're talking about institutions that includes uh, businesses, government, um, housing, real estate, employment, uh, news media, banking, finance, healthcare, education, and uh, the law enforcement and judicial system and understanding uh, that because entire organizations are involved, institutional racism negatively affects uh, people of color on a larger scale. And the fact that all of these institutions are interrelated, working together, they cause a system of racism or systemic racism. So recognizing that it wasn't just any one thing, one thing we could point to. Um, finding ourselves in a position where uh, we had to deal with the, the, the water crisis and uh, understanding um, after a while that it was something that could have been avoided. Um, there were just some systems at play where the folk were not doing their jobs, where the folk were covering up, whether they were not talking, whether they were not collaborating, a lot of things were going wrong. And um, it, it still amazes me um, at how I still get um, like that gut punch feeling when I think about it, because uh, the one thing that bothered me most about uh, being put in that situation and we were put in that situation, that wasn't just a natural thing that happened. It didn't have to happen. But the fact that um, I consider myself an older person and I've lived a number of years, but I was really irritated, I'll use that word, irritated, that folk allowed me to give that water to my grandbabies. So it was just so many disconnects involved with the water crisis. And, you know, it didn't start there. I mean, these systems and structures and, um, the uh, institutionalized racism, uh, it didn't start with the water crisis. It's been in place forever. So many things, um, just like other communities across the country, you know, the, the different 
um, situations people of color find themselves in when it comes to all of these institutions. It was going on all the time. But one thing that really got my attention um, because we worked through the war and we're still working through the water crisis. Um, it, it bothered me that my black and brown brothers and sisters were asking for help and being ignored uh, when that came about. And it appeared that the message was heard when somebody else brought the message forward. That was troubling, right? But the other piece that really uh, just still resonates with me and, and I'm moving beyond the water crisis and talking about COVID now. When we started to work on COVID here in, in my community um, and we were, um, I, I'm gonna say we're a progressive community. We um, across many sectors within the community uh, created this task force to really look at what was happening with COVID and how we needed to respond to it, how we could come together and help our community understand what was going on, how we could help um, translate the messages into messages that community folk would accept. Um, it, was, it was just, it was mind boggling to know that um, when we started to work on this, we called ourselves the task force, the, the coronavirus task force um, to address health disparities. And as we continue to work, we realized that we really needed to be focused on racial disparities because we were able to see that COVID was impacting black and brown communities more than other communities. And that's where the other things come into play. So it's not, it was uh, things that had happened to folk over the years, the, the, the conditions they had had to live in, uh, just different things that was happening, but understanding that we needed to call that out. We didn't wanna just call it health disparities. We knew um, that we needed to be talking about racial uh, disparities. And uh, so much work is going on in the community. Um, I just wanna lift up uh, one of our young um, uh, PhDs, uh, Dr. Kent Key, who is doing a lot of work on uh, racism. And he created, uh, a crafted this resolution that was adopted by um, our county to really focus on racism and understand how it impacts not just individuals, but also how it impacts um, institutions and what working across um, the different systems, how it impacts the uh, black and brown people of our communities. And so thinking about how maybe CBPR could help, I, I'm thinking that because of the relationship oriented partnerships that CBPR allows us to create. I'm thinking that we would be in a position to really start to look more closely at, and I think in, in some circles we're already doing that, but look at institutional racism, look at the structural racism and look at the systemic racism and start to really approach that the same way we were approaching the undoing racism workshops where we can um, identify what those systems are, identify where those areas are and start to uh, peel back the layers and uh, figure out what we need to do to dismantle it. But I think C CBPR would, would put us in a position where we could at least talk about these things because of the way it allows us to interact with each other. Th thanks so much, Ella. And I, I truly believe that we're not going to get to health equity uh, in this country without dismantling institutionalized racism. And that's why I believe that CDPR is such an important uh, vehicle. Uh, let me go to Mary. M Mary, in some of your writings, uh, you talk about CDPR not only as a tool uh, for generating knowledge, but as a force for social change. Can you talk about your work on the wage theft in San Francisco Chinatown, as an example of just how CBPR 
can be a force for social change. I can, and I can do it in under three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the example Michael is uh, referring to is an ideal case scenario in CBPR when the community seeks out the academic partners, says we want to do a study on, in this case, um, the health and safety of immigrant restaurant workers, but we want it to be really rigorous. We want to partner with you, but we'll be in control. It was terrific. And um, they reached out to the Labor Occupational Health Program, which is a hidden gem of the School of Public Health. Uh, and they in turn reached out to me. We went to Chinatown to meet with this organization. It quickly became clear that their primary concern was with wage theft, uh, saying slow pay, no pay. You don't get paid for three months. And then they say, oh, well, if you don't want to, it'll be a few more months. If you want to wait, it's okay. There's plenty more like you, you can quit. Uh, just horrific stuff. Having your tip money taken by the boss, um, having your lunch breaks shortened if you're not a smoker. So people pretend to smoke, uh, just crazy stuff. Anyway, um, we brought in the DR, the, uh, with their permission, the Department of Public Health, and we got a CDC grant to fund this, and then very quickly helped them get a large grant to supplement what they were already getting, which was a good chunk of this, uh, the grant that we got from CDC went directly to the community. Um, the Chinese Progressive Association hired and trained this core group of nine worker partners in, who are active in all stages of the process. Uh, later, an additional 12 surveyors. We had some of the staff from LOHP, two Chinese staff members who were able to help in doing popular education to help them really understand what research was about. Um, and together, they were able to do surveys, detailed surveys of 433 restaurant workers after having gone through all the surveys, made sure they were all culturally appropriate items and socially appropriate. Um, they also helped the health department develop an observational checklist to, for the first time, really look at health and safety from the perspective of, employer, of, of the employees and not the customers. And they got that checklist used in all but two of the 108 restaurants. Well, the data from both these data sources uh, really captured, oh, let me show you this. Um, they really got a lot of data on wage theft. And this is one thing I love. I don't know if you can see this. It's mm -hmm. a book on the findings first put together for community residents and for um, politicians. And it ends up with a, you know, it has all the key findings, and then ends up with a, a workers' bill, so bill of rights for San Francisco that they also wanted to pass. Well, to launch this Check, Please booklet, they had a community meeting. I counted uh, 20 different media outlets that were there. Four of the city supervisors were there. Uh, 200 people crammed into the residents, crammed into the main room, and then there were more outside listening on it on a loudspeaker. It got a lot of attention. Um, the news media, there were a lot of stories the next few days. And then CPA quickly contacted one of the supervisors who'd been there. Uh, and they together quickly crafted a wage theft ordinance, uh, which if, fast, if passed would make San Francisco only the second major city in the country with such an ordinance. Plus uh, this one, was going to include an enforcement uh, piece, which the one in Miami didn't have. Well, uh, this measure was passed uh, and the wage theft victories that started coming in were just amazing. And it's especially impressive that the uh, worker partners would often go to confront their own bosses. They would mobilize the workplaces. They would go and tell the bosses, we're doing this lawsuit because we have to get our back pay. Uh, the, the, the strength of these uh, immigrant workers was just amazing. Well, I just wanted to share some of those wage theft victories. The first one brought in 530,000 in back pay for just a small number of people in a small restaurant. Uh, it's amazing how that, that shows the magnitude 
of the ripoff. Uh, the next one brought in, um, let's see, 100, it was one and a quarter million. And again, restaurant workers in one restaurant. Then we had one for four and four million and more. Others followed the most recently. There was one that uh, was uh, the, the uh, money started flowing last year, middle of the pandemic. These worker partners, many the workers, many of whom lost their jobs by then were getting a lot of back pay. So that's been great, but equally important, CPA is now recognized as one of the national leaders of the wage theft movement in the United States. They provide help to all these other community groups around the country that want to do similar research and organizing. Uh, I've been contacted and reached out to other academic partners about roles that they can play. The health department has been terrific sharing their, um, their checklist with all other health departments in the country on their website. And um, uh, just in terms of capacity building, the worker partners went on to broaden and deepen their advocacy and their other work for social justice. And I'll add that our former DRPH student, Charlotte Chang, who was just an immense contributor mm -hmm. to this project, uh, was invited to be on the board of directors of the Chinese Progressive Association. And one of the staff at LOHP was invited to chair the board. So it was a full circle uh, and just a, a wonderful project to be, be able to be involved with. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, Mary, uh, you know, funders have a role in driving social change. And yet in a landmark article you made APH back in 2001, you raised this question about CVPR. Can public health researchers and agencies reconcile the push from the funding bodies and the pull from communities? Can you explain what you mean by that? And also what you said about the tension between uh, internal and external validity? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> well, I think the, um, the real quandary that we had, I think, early on in getting funding for community-based participatory research had <clears throat> a lot to do with the funding histories and habits of the federal agencies and the foundations that we depended on for funding. Uh, they were so accustomed to starting with a hypothesis based on previous literature in which a problem was identified by the academics who were writing the grant application and who were schooled in writing it in such a way as to uh, put forth a proposition in the form of a hypothesis. And then the judgment of the application came down to a peer review panel made up of other academics. And <clears throat> nowhere in this panoply of participants in the process have we had we heard much from the people whose health behavior or health conditions or health problems were being represented. And uh, so I think there was a lot of work to do and a lot of people who helped with this, including those on this panel, uh, in redefining how a research grant should be processed, mm -hmm. beginning with the naming of the problem, uh, moving to understanding what might be uh, an approach to studying the problem. And it was just those, those very raw steps that needed to be built into systems, into grant making systems. Uh, and th there was a lot of shoe leather involved in running from one agency to another mm -hmm. who had been catching wind of this issue and reading some of Mary's and uh, and the others here writing on the subject, but uh, and feeling some pressure to pay attention to it, but not knowing 
how to proceed. So that's where I think all of us were early in our careers, or at least midway in our careers, in my case, in trying to solve the problems we're discussing. And it took a lot of conversations, a lot of consultations, a lot of PowerPoint slide presentations mm -hmm. to try to help them understand the issues we've just been discussing and describing. And, uh, and then the, the, the Institute of Medicine stepped up to their game and started appointing committees mm -hmm. to make uh, expert committee reports on some of the issues. One of them was linking research and public health practice, a review of CDC's program of centers of research and demonstration and disease prevention. <clears throat> they asked me to chair that committee. And that really was a leverage point because the Institute of Medicine's reports become touchstones for peer review. They become justifications for the hypotheses and uh, strategies that people are writing about in their, in their grant applications. So that, that just give, gives you a sampling of what I think were uh, points of turning the curve in bringing attention to the issues we've been discussing here early while the NIH tradition of peer review continued in its mode of expert review of hypothesis testing where the hypothesis came from the literature and not from the public. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Emily, universities have a role in driving social change and yet researchers in many universities are dis disincentivized from engaging their communities in partner research. Can you talk about that and what needs to change in the university system in order to take academic community partnership to the next level? Thanks, well, that's a great segue from what Larry was saying, because I think if um, it's important for universities, especially research one, uh, universities like Berkeley to recognize that the value of research uh, beyond the contribution to the literature. So of course, we, you know, whenever, when we go up for tenure, when we go up for promotion, we're making the case that we're contributing to the knowledge base in the field. But it's very important that our evaluation systems also uh, recognize and value the public impact contribution that we make and also understand what it takes to do this kind of partnered research. So if you're looking at a research por portfolio, you know, we've heard the kind of intensive partnership work and efforts it takes to do you know, the kind of work that all have been talking about. Um, and so if you're looking at a portfolio, you would want the folks who are evaluating that portfolio to really get what, what it takes to do that work well and how that work, how that partnership strengthens the excellence of the research, that it's not a trade-off between excellence and participation, but that we have bet more valid research and more impactful research because of that intentional, um, it, you know, committed work that we're doing. And so we've had a recent win. Uh, I, I'm, we're so gratified, obviously building on the shoulders of all of these giants um, and, and all of the value that the School of Public Health and Michael, your leadership and prior deans, I think really do recognize the value of participatory scholarship as well as other forms of community partnered scholarship. Because um, as our colleague, Rachel Morello Frost has talked about the, the relevance, the reach, the impact, the way that we, that we see of how it makes the research stronger. But we had a recent win. We're lucky that it's valued um, within our school but the, but the issue is how does that get valued at the campus level and how does that get valued by other institutions? So we had a recent win um, as part of this Catalyst grant that Michael, you supported and the deans in education and social welfare and our vice chancellor for research office is supporting that we actually have changed the guidelines. We have new guidelines 
um, at the Berkeley campus for valuing um, and crediting community engaged scholarship, particularly some of the forms that often are invisible in our faculty portfolios, like research briefs or white papers or the kinds of things that when you're doing that practice based evidence work don't always show up in the peer reviewed journals or the peer reviewed books. And so that's been a huge win. Um, but we, now we need to disseminate it and make sure people uh, know it across campus. And then we're also working on issues of research administration and uh, IRBs and all of the ways in which um, the because um, this work doesn't um, fit the templates of traditional kind of clinical, you know, basic science research, that often there are misalignments in ways where we feel like we're kind of beating our heads against the wall and trying to kind of fight to do this work in the university system, even though our, our values at Berkeley, you know, we feel that pub, you know, public impact and public purpose is in our DNA, but yet the research systems are often set up for other kinds of research. So we have a meeting with the, um, there are our provost and our incoming provost and a lot of campus leaders um, that you'll be a part of, Michael, in this coming month. And we're really hopeful that we can have that kind of brainstorm to really think about how do we have, um, how, what's the commons, how to, how to outside the schools and units that value this work, how can we have a sustained institutional change at Berkeley? So that's one example, and I'm happy to share more with anyone who's interested in that. Thanks so much, Emily, and, and thank you for, for the, the, this great work that, that you're leading. I, I know we're running out of time, uh, but I'm just kind of rem I'm, I'm reminded by Elise uh, that we actually have a lot of people tune in to this, uh, including people like calling in from Oklahoma and Michigan and New Mexico from uh, just mm -hmm. a lot of places, uh, and they've been typing in questions in the chat. So I think we should at least take a couple questions uh, so, so if it's okay with you, we're going to go 10 minutes over. Uh, Elise, uh, can you pick out two of the best questions for our panelists? Yeah, sure. Uh, I just also wanted to say that people have been so thankful in the chat. They've been thanking everybody on this panel more than they've been asking questions. And I learned a new word, which is thank you in Cherokee, wado. Um, which somebody um, entered in the chat, especially for Dr. Duran. Um, so the first uh, question is actually from one of our um, faculty here at the school. It's from Linda Neuhauser. She's a clinical professor of community health sciences here at the uh, Berkeley, um, UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And she asks, would any of you propose to change the term CBPR to another term that does not just emphasize research, something like CBPRA, where A is for action. Well, I can speak to that for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with um, our health councils, 33 health, uh, uh, health councils from county based in our state and nine tribal health councils. And they're not necessarily wanting to do research, but they want to up, create a much higher status for community participation. And we have a CBPR model that Bonnie and I and many, and Ella has worked with on, and Mary on this call um, that really looks at a very dynamic way of thinking about CBPR that you have to think about each local context. How is each local context able to partner? What are the actions that emerge from that? The interventions, the research design, and what are the outcomes? And they're wanting, and this model is being used in multiple languages and it's being transformed in every community almost. So we're in the process of redeveloping the model and even just calling it community-based community based, um, community based participatory practice or community-based participatory action. Or, I mean, it's gonna include local data, it's gonna include the role of data, data driving policy, driving action, but maybe taking out that word to um, use the process that's being driven locally from the grassroots to find something that everybody is going to agree. To. And because we're creating an equity based model that all the counties and the tribal councils want to buy into. So we're playing with that much now. I really want to hold on to CBPR as the overarching frame, but I've mm -hmm. seen our model being transposed in Swedish and German, in Spanish and Portuguese, and people are creating new ways of thinking using these core major domains. 
Um, so yes, it can be, but I don't want to give up CDPR as the groundwork. Thanks so much, Nina. Elise, let's take another question. Sure, this um, other question is uh, directly for Dr. Ozer from Kiona Jones. Her question is, how has COVID and the changes in current school settings affected the facilitation of CBPR at the K-12 level? What are some strategies for planning through the challenges? That is such a deep and timely question. Um, and one that we've been studying directly and also just working with our community partners and many of my colleagues across the country who do YPAR trying to, in some ways, really focus on trying to sustain this work and help support sustain this work. Um, it has, um, it has been uh, ironically one of the things that was one of the one of the conditions that was very important for sustainability in K-12 education was having a classroom, a sort of a dedicated class. So in our example, a classroom elective with peer resources. But when um, schools went online, then that was, uh, it was not a, re a resiliency factor for YPAR. Um, I, think, I think being able to do this work remotely also though does open up very interesting opportunities um, for young people to connect with each other across sites and nationally. And so I, one of the things um, we've been, I, I'm uh, leading a network um, of YPAR scholars and practitioners across the country. And one of the projects we're looking to fund might be, is a broader platform, a more sustained platform um, of how, that, that isn't dependent on classroom, on, on the classroom time to do this work. Um, and also I think connects up with, there's so much excitement and interest about participatory research and about youth voice and student voice right now. And I think it's really critical to think about the sustained work that is building on the partners who, who do this work. So that it's not like one off each time an organization says, hey, we want youth voice, but that we really think about how this work gets sustained over time and helps to support the anchor community-based institutions who've been doing this work and have these trusting relationships with young people. So I would love to follow up on that question. Um, that's something we're actively working on and writing about. Thanks so much, Emily. I'm gonna to try to conclude this conversation by asking our panelists this one last question. Many decades, but where do we go from here? What recommendations do you have to help take CPPR to the next level so that? Uh -oh. <clears throat> maybe, up. maybe we can start with Nina. Oh, well, to take CPPR to the next level, we're working right now on moving beyond identifying what are the best practices that really contribute to outcomes and going to what Emily was talking about which is what are, how are the institutions needing to change? Our academic health centers, our academic health <laughs> field needing to change to actually support long stand, standing commitments to communities rather than one-off individual projects. Whether it's tenure and promotion issues, whether it's IRB issues, whether it's finance, ha having better contracts with community-based organizations, whether it's funding the community-based organizations first or the tribal mm -hmm. nations first who then might contract with the university. Mm -hmm. So we need to trans, so we have a PCORI grant to explore this now, but I think the scaling up to what is the institution uh, doing itself what, to, to protect and strengthen community engagement in a really genuine way is what the next stages are for our field. Thanks, Nina. Uh, Bonnie, let's go to you next. I don't want to sound like a downer, but <laughs> a Debbie downer, but 
you know, we still have a huge way to go. I mean, Nina, don't you remember we submitted one grant to DCBPR and they said, oh yeah, do the science, but we're taking out all of the community engagement money. I think, uh, and you know, we know what just happened with JAMA, right? The Journal of the American Medical Association. The editor said, oh, we don't have to worry. There's no racism in medicine. That's mm. crazy thinking. And I think that, um, there's still a huge amount of work to be done and uh, people don't even want to understand or address their unconscious bias and in huge institutions. I think National Institutes of Health needs to uh, fund more community engagement. They don't want to fund that. You know, they'll fund collecting data and a statistician for days, but community engagement you know, they are seeing that as very peripheral to the real work. And our institutions, you know, uh, medicine and public health and social work and, you know, all of our um, community-based organizations and their federal entities, you know, we need to really look at those and see how they're not supporting authentic community engagement. I think a lot of people are getting funded to do bare minimums of community engagement as well. So I think we still have a lot of, lot of work to do. But I'm encouraged by all of the people on this panel that, you know, they're doing it very authentically and uh, that's the way it needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Uh, Ella? <clears throat> So I, I guess I would ditto both uh, Nina's comment and uh, Bonnie's because I jotted down two things um, that we need more sustainable uh, funding. And I know that's uh, like conversations with the funding uh, institutions um, and um, to be able to look at incentives for academics because academics have not always been rewarded uh, when they wanted to do or encouraged to do um, CBPR. So those are the two things I thought about, um, but definitely needing more funding and to be able to sustain those programs that seem to work in communities rather than looking for new programs to fund. So those are just, that's where I would start in moving forward. Thanks, Ella. Larry? <clears throat> Say, Mary, the mic was again a little weird. Oh, uh, Larry. Larry. Larry, okay. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the term that seemed to help us turn the corner in uh, the funding agencies was translational research. Mm. It really turned the heads of those who thought that they had, the, they had <clears throat> a monopoly on the language for taking research to practice or bringing practice to practice questions to research. And I think translational research helped to break us out of that mold and to <clears throat> engage the, uh, the, the, the recipients of the past of research efforts in the process of formulating the research. And taking the, <clears throat> the evidence that had accumulated and asking how, how are we to translate this into effective practice? There was a recognition that a very large percentage of what had been published was not being applied. What had been published as very promising uh, evidence <clears throat> was not being used. And so, uh, <clears throat> A period of emphasis on translational research, I think, has probably produced some of our greatest strides at the federal level, at least, in recasting the understanding of what else is needed besides what we've been doing at NIH and CDC and other agencies. Thanks so much, Larry. Emily? Well, I think the pieces that have already been mentioned about funding is critical, um, but I, I think I think the changing the institutional structures of the university, but also the larger systems like K-12 education, and it occurs to me that there have now been thousands of young people 
who have been trained in YPAR or who have been trained in a similar type process. And where do they go? What, you know, the, think, of, think of that whole cohorts of young people who could be doing adults, you know, who, where, what, what's their leadership? What's their pathway into leadership um, in, in, the, in their communities? I just think we could, we could have a connection between what's happening in the youth development and YPAR field and what's happening in the broader CBPR field that could be very interesting and exciting um, possibility. And it did, that didn't really occur to me until uh, this panel, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, I'm going to give you the last word. Me? What did you yep. say? Oh, sorry, the mic's going kind of in and out. Um, yeah, this is hard. I had some last recommendations and people have almost all made them. Um, I do. I did have one, though, on Emily's groundbreaking work, and she does not take credit. I mean, this is Ms. Uh, you know, youth participatory action. She, she came up with it. And uh, I think when we think about the leadership of youth. On no, I, had, I did not. So, but anyway. Okay. Well, she's the, the goddess. Anyway, um, when we <laughs> think of the leadership of our youth on things like gun violence and climate change, and I'm thinking how much more effective could they be if they had an Emily Oz or anyone else helping them develop these skills in school and maybe in college or wherever, but, but come out and have that to add to all they already bring. They bring the passion and the commitment, but this is a set of skills that they probably don't have and that, that they could. Um, I was just gonna say a couple of the things based on what others have said. Uh, Ella's point about projects ultimately are, are stronger. And I think the possibility of getting to more seamless work with communities is stronger when the communities are heard. Bonnie's been making this point throughout too. Um, but when, you know, in, in, in Ella's case, the community held up progress and they said, no, we, you need to understand the community uh, issues here and the community interests, what we need to see happen. There were tensions, the project, what the, the what came out of this, the program that came out of this was much stronger than it would have been, got renewed funding. Um, uh, there was a colleague of ours, uh, Stephanie Farquhar, who was part of a chapter in this new community organizing book. And I think it was a transgender community that she was working with, where one of the members said to the outsiders, the health department, if you wanna go fast, go slow. And I think that's part of what we've been hearing today. Nina brought that up too, that, you know, and the, and the other thing is communities don't walk away. Nina, I think you said that. Um, one of my big concerns, if we're going to bring this to the next level, uh, we have got to get out of the habit of leaving when the funding runs out. I mean, we absolutely cast ourselves as the parachute researchers, but we also miss the fact that the most important outcomes of these projects invariably, and particularly in terms of policy change, are once the funding has gone. And, you know, we, the, the community stays. We've, we've heard that from so many of you. If we can stay behind too, uh, you know, we most of us have other money. We got a tenure track position sometimes. Mm -hmm there's no need for us to get up and walk away. It's the worst thing we can do. So I think if we're going to get to the next level, that has to be a piece of it. And maybe there needs to be, as Emily's been suggesting, institutional support for those faculty who want to do this work so that they can stay for the long haul. That's one of the 12 core principles of CBPR. And I think it's essential. Okay, th thanks so much, Mary. And uh... With that, I'm gonna go ahead and close today's event by thanking our panelists. I know that humility is a core value of CBPR. So any reference to Cooperstown is probably the wrong analogy, but I just feel so privileged to have spent the last 90 minutes in conversation with six innovators, change makers, and art vendors of public health who truly belong in the hall of fame for CBPR. <laughs> So thank you for such an amazing conversation. Thank you for your life's work in elevating the voice of the community and transforming medical and public health research. And let me just also thank our audience 
for joining us this evening. And please tune in for next month's Dean Speaker Series on February 15th, where I will be talking with more innovators, change makers, and art vendors of public health about universal healthcare. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah.